All right, hello everyone. Thanks again for having me and inviting me again to give a talk here at KITP. This is an honor, as usual, and a great pleasure. Um, so I will not give too much of an introduction um, because there's so much, uh, so many experts and we had a lot of discussions on triangular systems. Uh, so my focus today will be squarely focused on systems that have magnetic ordering or whether we have exotic magnetic excitations, which we can track with, uh, you name it, we guess it with neutron scattering. Uh, one point I want to make, though, is that one of the things that has allowed us to really understand some of these magnetic systems is, is the advancement in this technology of direct geometry and neutron spectrometer, by which we can measure the full correlations in momentum and energy space of a given, of a given magnet. And uh, in my talk, I will rely on examples where we measure the entire dynamical structure uh, factor or the energy integrated structure factor to model the system uh, to, to, to great accuracy. And also, we will use the sum rules that this structure factor uh, has in order to determine uh, particular aspects of quantum to classical crossover. So really, this time of flight neutron spectrometers has, have really advanced uh, to such a point that we can do the experiments that Andre showed and uh, that, I, that I will show today. Okay. So uh, at the start of everything, there is, of course, chemistry. And uh, one of the uh, very cool paper that came out in 2017 by the group at Oak Ridge is the list of many different materials here with the triangular lattice uh, transition metal dye highlight. And so I was very pleased to hear our chairwoman today venturing into pronouncing chemical names. Um, and so this is a good sign that uh, uh, theorists uh, uh, start to, to realize that the diversity of materials, and, and we do realize this, of course, that the diversity of materials we have with similar structure can give us many different uh, interesting physics. And here, uh, you know, you might be tempted as, as, as an experimentalist to, uh, to do this uh, Pokemon game uh, called Gotta Catch Them All. And here today I will, I will talk about two, two of these Pokemons that we caught, the iron iodine and the cobalt iodine. Um, and so uh, these two materials have the specificity to have a slightly uh, um, complicated magnetic structures and anisotropies. And as I will see, this plays a lot into the dynamics of the system. So this is the menu for today. I will uh, discuss these two materials, which you can imagine um, as essentially a spin one system for the FAI2 non Kramer system and a Kramer system with spin, effective spin one half for the Cobalt system. I will discuss their magnetic structures and the minimal Hamiltonians that we may hope to write for the systems. Then I will spend a lot of time on the excitations of FAI2, first uh, explaining the particular uh, coupling between dipolar and quadrupolar fluctuations, talking about the presence of higher magnon bond states in the system, talking about the magnon decay dynamics that emerges from this, and if I have time, a little bit about the finite temperature dynamics. And then I will talk about a, a work which I'm involved with from Korea on the excitations in the cobalt system, where we will also observe spontaneous magnon decays. So let me start with comparing these two materials. So they have the similar crystal structure, uh, uh, so hexagonal uh, or rhombohedral space group, sorry, and uh, the iron iodine has a 3D6 configuration. So in the particular cubic crystal field, um, what you obtain, um, uh, uh, first you apply the cubic crystal field, then the spin orbit coupling, and um, so you have an effective one uh, uh, manifolds of state that is split by a weak trigonal distortion. So the low energy of the system, the low energy physics of the system is dominated by uh, this doublet and the singlet here, which you can represent as an effective spin one degree of freedom with a strong single ion anisotropy. And the single ion anisotropy is of the order of two ambulate electron volts. In the cobalt iodine, you essentially go from the uh, one more electron uh, in this very similar uh, crystal environment, and so you can do the same tricks, except now your manifold is a spin one half manifold, and so you're left with um, obviously, a, a Kramer's doublet here as a low energy manifold. And so the distinction between these two systems is here you have an effective spin one half degree of freedom, and here you have an effective spin one with a strong single ion anisotropy. So this is the two systems that I want to, you know, compare to each other. Um, and so just to uh, give you some insights on this, uh, so they are high, higher energy excitations. So here you can see in the FEI2 material, they are around 30 millivolts. Uh, the same for the, uh, on the part of the cobalt iodine material. Uh, it's actually interesting that these excitations, this higher energy crystal field excitation have dispersion. Um, and there was a recent proposal by Gong Shen that this is due to quadrupolar interactions. Uh, we have not fully understood this at uh, this point, so I will not talk about this. My talk will be squarely focused on the low energy excitations of the system. So whether there is some, uh, you know, crystal field dispersion in, in, in these materials. Okay, so let's compare the two materials. Uh, they have particular magnetic structures that are, uh, uh, you know, non, non, com not completely trivial. 
for the FEI uh, I2, we have a commensurate magnetic structure with a one quarter zero one quarter structure. So you have some stripes that run along one of the crystallographic axis, and you see this one this quadrupling of the of the unit cell in one direction, uh, and it orders at nine Kelvin. Uh, the cobalt iodine has a slightly more complicated magnetic structure. It's a, it's a commensurate spiral with a 1 over 8 uh, propagation vector. It also orders at a comparatively, uh, you know, a convenient temperature, let's say 11 Kelvin. Um, and so um, the first thing that you might think is that there must be some complicated exchange interactions to stabilize these two, you know, non-usual or, or you know, not so simple magnetic structures. And if you think about it, you, you essentially need further neighbor exchange here uh, and here, uh, including J3, to stabilize this. And if you want to understand the out-of-plane coupling, you also need a lot of uh, complex exchange interactions. So in our models, we go to the third neighbor in the plane, and we include all the way to four uh, exchange interactions between the planes. That's, a, that's kind of a minimal model to understand this. And so I'm introducing here, if you want to understand the Hamiltonian of these materials, I'm introducing a new concept today which is the maximally anisotropic, minimally long range mammal Hamiltonian. Um, and so uh, this is a way we're starting to actually think about, about materials, which is to really take anisotropy, uh, uh, you know, the maximally, maximally, maximal anisotropy and just adding the long range interactions as we need them to stabilize the magnetic structures. So in this particular space group, the uh, uh, nearest neighbor interaction splits into four possible terms in the matrix. Uh, so there's an XXZ-like uh, term and a symmetric of diagonal exchanges. Um, of course, for the FEI2, we have a strong single ion anisotropy in addition to this uh, symmetric, uh, symmetric of diagonal exchange. Of course, with the cobalt, there is no single ion anisotropy. So that's a very clear difference uh, between these two materials. Okay? And so one thing that is important for the FEI2 is that you have a competition in spin space between uh, uh, axial anisotropy of the single ion physics and the, and, and the off-diagonal exchange of in the plane of the triangular. And so in some sense, this makes SZ not a good quantum number, and all of the physics that I'm going to talk about essentially comes from this competition between, between uh, anisotropies. Okay? And uh, this is, um, in some sense, the result of the work, although that's not the most important part, uh, as we will see. But uh, you can imagine that these triangular systems, they have sizable Kitayev interactions, also, although the way we like to describe the system is to use this parameterization of the exchange. This is a natural and the obvious way to do it. But if you want to write this in terms of Kitayev, uh, what you will find is that the FEI2 is actually a ferromagnetic system with strong, relatively speaking, anti-ferromagnetic Kitayev interaction. And the cobalt system also has of diagonal exchanges. So these are, in some sense, squarely triangular lattice Kitayev systems. But this is not the right basis to describe the problem. This is a much more useful basis for us, as you will see, to talk about the physics. Okay, so uh, what I want to show you that I think is interesting is that both the systems show definitive evidence of magnon decay, so it means the excitations are unstable uh, in certain regimes, so in FEI2 under applied magnetic field, in cobalt iodine in zero field. And the mechanism for that comes from off-diagonal exchange, at least in FEI2, but in slightly different mechanisms. So I want to contrast these two things together. So let me start with FEI2. Uh, so uh, um, first I'll start with uh, our first paper on this, which was the thesis of Georges Anbai in my group. He's now a faculty at Louisiana State University. And this is a tremendous and long-standing collaboration with Christian's group. And so some of uh, Christian's group members are here in the audience. And uh, we used all the, essentially all the spectrometers available to us at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. And that particular sample was grown by He Dong Zhu at uh, Tennessee. So let me start with a toy model of FEI2 to get a flavor of, of the physics we might expect and then dive into the, uh, the physics. Uh, so in FEI2, we have locally effective spin one degrees of freedom. So if you represent the Hilbert space of this magnet, you need to consider the, the possibility that the spin goes from plus one to zero, but also from plus one to minus one. So there's different ways you can deal with this. One of the ways to represent the dynamics of that local Hilbert space with coherent states. Uh, and so this is what we will do in this talk. So it means there is dipolar and quadrupolar degrees of freedom associated with each site. Um, and now if you have a single ion anisotropy and ferromagnetic interactions, of course the ground state is trivial. However, the excitations may not be trivial. You can imagine flipping one spin from plus one to zero. This is your usual one magnon excitation. But you can do more complicated things. You can flip two spins, so delta is z equal two excitations, so you can create two magnons on different sites. You can create two magnons on neighboring sites, then this will already be a bound state. There's a little bit of exchange stabilization. 
But what's really neat in this system is that you can also create two magnons on the same site, and this will be what we call a single ion bond state. And if the anisotropy is the largest um, term in the Hamiltonian, this bond state may be the lowest energy excitation in the system. So uh, all of this comes from just the local Hilbert space of the magnet and the fact that you have a ferromagnetically aligned system. Okay? And so what do you expect from this just as a spectroscopist? Uh, so, so this double spin flip on the same side, if you wish, uh, resembles or is a quadrupolar excitation. It's a double spin flip. Uh, and so in principle, quadrupolar excitations are invisible in neutron scattering um, because neutron scattering is, neutron is a spin one half, so we are bound by the dipolar selection rule. Uh, but as I told you, uh, because of these competing anisotropies, SZ may not be a good quantum number for the system, and that may allow us to see uh, different different sectors of the of the excitation spectrum. Uh, so, you know, at the start of a good neutron experiment is a good crystal, and so uh, we also use this Bridgman technique that Andre showed, where uh, in the lab at Georgia Tech we were able to grow some small crystals with chemical vapor transport, but then we could grow a beast of you know eight gram single crystal with this Bridgman uh, technique, and so then. Uh, you know, get, get very high resolution data. Um, and uh, the first thing I want to show you is how we start when we have a project like this to understand the complicated magnetic Hamiltonian at hands. Um, and we, we really rely on this uh, uh, broadband inelastic neutron scattering technique, meaning that we can measure the system at different web, with different wavelengths and see whether with high resolution or with coarse resolution but a lot of momentum covering, we can see uh, different aspects of the coalitions in the system. And that's very useful. If you integrate over all energies, your, your structure factor is proportional to the instantaneous correlations. And that may allow you to understand the Hamiltonian in the system. So this is what we do here. Um, we actually take the system just above Tn, so it orders at 9 Kelvin, and here this is 11 Kelvin, I believe. And what we do is we map, the, the, in three dimensions, we map the correlations in the system. And you see that just above TNEL, we are in a correlated power magnet. The, it's the liquid, so there are strong correlations between the spins. And so, of course, these correlations uh, uh, reflect the nature of the underly underlying Hamiltonian. And so, you know, there's many different ways you can analyze such data. Uh, we re very much like this SCGA technique introduced, or perhaps made popular by Conlon and Schalker, but you can also use what Joe Patterson uses, which is the Onzaga reaction mean field approach. But all of these are techniques to model the correlated paramagnetic state. Um, and so what we can do is fit that data, uh, essentially all the pixels, thousands of pixels of this data to, the, to these techniques, and we can extract here an exchange model, which is purely Heisenberg. And so what you see is that indeed we need J1, J2, J3, and some uh, out-of-plane exchange interactions to um, to model these coalitions, although, of course, the, the single ion anisotropy is the dominant term in this, in this magnet. Uh, okay, very good. So, so, in fact, this is energy integrated, so we can just look at the energy resolved response, and so this is the uh, highlight uh, uh, excitation spectrum of this magnet. So here we are looking at energy transfer below 10 MeV and momentum transfer in the triangular lattice plane. And the first thing you notice in that spectrum is that there are two distinct bands of excitations. Uh, so the, the upper band and the low band. And so what's really striking between them is that they seem to have uh, avoided crossing type patterns. So this is very, you know, very, very pronounced, avoided crossing. Um, so through modeling, we now understand that this is a single magnon-like band and this is a single ion bond state-like band. Of course, all of these are dipolar excitations in the sense that that's all we see with neutron scattering, but this have more single ion character and this have more single magnon character. Um, another thing that caught our attention in the beginning is that uh, you see uh, this box here in momentum energy space. Uh, these are two equivalent directions of the, of the triangular lattice brilliant zone. However, the intensity is different along these two different directions. And so this is a modulation of intensity that uh, comes from the dipole factor of the neutron scattering cross section. And in fact, uh, Joe Patterson has a beautiful paper where he shows that this kind of modulations are an indication of anisotropy in spin space. So this already tells us two things. Uh, to model the excitations of this magnet, we need two flavors of excitations, and we probably need off-diagonal exchange because we see this modulation. Um, and so uh, just to convince you that this is necessary here, if we just use so the uh, Eisenberg exchange model that we just determine from the paramagnetic scattering, and we do linear spin with theory with dipolar modes only. Uh, so you see that the, the interactions we just got uh, here, they, uh, they somehow predict the bandwidth and the general features of, of, of this uh, excitation spectrum. Uh, they also pre uh, uh, predict the presence of a bond state, which would be invisible in that, at that level of the theory, uh, overlapping with this band. But you see that this anti-crossing obviously is not present. 
So in order to get that on-site crossing, you need to crank off diagonal exchange interactions. Um, so uh, let's do this. So, well, you need to do that, and you also need to uh, give some dynamics to this, uh, uh, to this mode here, to this bond state mode. And we do this, or uh, at least Christian's uh, group does this by generalizing linear spin wave theory to two types of bosons with Schwinger bosons. Uh, so the zero boson and the minus one boson. And the uh, anisotropic exchange, if you include it, so here, say, the Jz plus minus term, uh, you realize that you have a term that creates a minus one boson from a zero boson, et cetera, et cetera. So including these two things, you can immediately explain um, your spectrum. So uh, this off-diagonal exchange opens a gap between these two bands. Um, and then, you know, the details of the dispersion here that comes from the fact that we have four sublattices, et cetera, et cetera, allows us to extract a lot of the, uh, a lot of the exchange interactions. So the most important part is that there is a hybridization between these two flavors of excitations. And also we have this J3 term, which gives rise to this stripe phase. Uh, there's just one remark I want to make here is that a spectrum like this, you can only understand in zero field. If you were to do the typical, uh, you know, high field neutron scattering experiment where we polarize the system, we would actually not be able to determine these exchange interactions because we need them to overlap to understand the hybridization. So this is a counterexample of, uh, you know, polarize your system and you will get your Hamiltonian. I think here it's, it's not the case. Good, and so uh, we can understand then that the dynamics of the system is given to us by the fact that we have dipolar and quadrupolar fluctuations. Uh, they hybridize, and so every excitation you see on this graph is a little bit dipolar, and, and if you project this uh, spin one state, uh, SU, SU3 coherent state, uh, into the dipolar sector, you see that each branch is a little bit dipolar, and so that's why we see all of these excitations. Okay? So uh, that's just the, you know, our understanding that there is such fluctuations. Now let me go to see what we can do with them. Um, and so uh, I'll turn to work we did with Peter's group, uh, Annuel Le Gros, and uh, uh, with Shang Shung Hao and, uh, and Christian's group. Um, and so now we turn to, uh, to uh, time uh, domain terahertz. But before, uh, before doing this, uh, I'd like to point out that FEI2, very much like the magnet we just saw before from Andre, as um, interesting high field physics, an interesting um, high field phase diagram. And so when you apply a field of the order of five Tesla, you have a series of metamagnetic transitions in that system. You can think about it more as an Ising system with a lot of metamagnetic transitions. Um, in this, uh, today we'll only talk about the low, uh, low energy, low, low field physics below four Tesla. Um, but I just want to point out some, um, perhaps the best e email I ever got in my life. Um, so if some of you know Louis-Pierre Rognaud is a famous neutron scatterer in France, he's now retired. Um, and of, when our first paper came out, he emailed me and he said uh, uh, there are some rants on the French uh, research system. But uh, apart from that, he also says that he has measured all the excitations in all the phases of this uh, magnet. However, the day he retired, CEA asked him to put in the trash all the data and all the records of everything. And so this is lost forever, okay? And so this is, this is what this email is about. And then he, um, if, you, if some of you want to know why they never published it um, uh, at the time, in the 1980s, he has a very nice explanation that uh, the student was trying to show that Louis Neel got a factor two wrong in the calculation of the ground state of the antiferromagnet. And so, uh, you know, I say that's the best email I, never got, I ever got because it gave me a lot of encouragement to, um, you know, to, to, to probe that physics. And, and I mean, it was kind of, kind of cool. Anyway, uh, for now, we'll stick to the low field physics. Uh, that might be another KITP talk in, in you know, a few years. If we don't turn crazy and start to look for factor twos in uh, Neil's seminal work. Um, okay, so the data here is from Peter's group. So this is terahertz spectroscopy as a function of magnetic field. And so uh, I would say that this is an exquisite technique to understand this material because we can do very high resolution field sweeps and understand many excitations that live in the system. Uh, and here, what is striking is this lines that come down from high energy. And you can try to uh, model by extracting the middle point of these lines, and you can try to understand them. Um, and so here, what we see is uh, what is essentially one magnon excitations. And from the slopes here, you can see that these are two magnon excitations. In the system, two magnon excitation means single ion bond state. It's on the single site that we create an excitation. But we also see excitations with uh, four times the slope. This would be two magnon two bond bond states, so it's a four magnon excitation, and then we would get three bond bond states, that would be a six magnon excitations. And you see that these excitations are seen in the terahertz spectroscopy. 
So SD is not a good quantum number. All your sector of high energy bound states is visible to you, and this is what this uh, this reveals. Okay. Um, so um, the uh, so the message here is that we observe up to six magnon excitations. Um, if you want to understand it in general, this means that the system has a small bandwidth. Okay, so there's a small exchange bandwidth over a large single ion anisotropy, and so we are essentially seeing here a flat flat uh, flat mode physics in some sense, where we have, we have uh, potential energy that creates this all these bond states um, in, in the system. Um, and so a natural question is how do they interact with each other, and do they interact with each other? Of course they will. Um, but before I show you this, uh, it's possible to model to some extent such uh, such data. You need to to, to do generalized spin wave theory. However, you see some of these excitations are, are, bond, are exchange bond states. So to, to understand them, you need to essentially sum an infinite series of, of uh, later diagrams because they are exchange bond states. And this is what uh, the, mag the magicians in uh, Christian's group can, can do for you. They can calculate these higher energy excitations, uh, this, this higher order excitations. And we see that, uh, that all of this uh, anti-crossing phenomena here are purely coming from the anisotropic exchange that couples and hybridize these excitations. Okay, so are the excitations interacting? Uh, in terms of they do. So another paper with Christian's group that was published a few uh, weeks ago, uh, where we investigate now with neutron scattering the field-induced spectrum. Um, so let's uh, recondense in a neutron scattering world here. This is energy and this is momentum transfer on the triangular plane. Uh, this is zero Tesla. I know we increase the field one Tesla, two Tesla, three and four. The magnetic structure of the system stays the same. So we stay in the same exact magnetic structure. Uh, you might wonder why we have less branches than I showed in the previous slide. This is because we managed to make a single domain compound. Uh, so when the uh, system orders magnetically, there's three different domains. Uh, the student misaligned the field with the crystal, um, which was the blessing here because that created a single domain of, this, of the material and allowed us to understand the physics more clearly. Uh, and so you see when you apply the magnetic field, this branch is a split in various different ways. Um, and when we reach high field, um, there starts to be some, some broadening like phenomena. And this is the most apparent here at four Tesla. We see this, um, this branch of single ion bond state branch that suddenly becomes very damped. And when we do generalized spin wave calculations at the linear order, you see that this damping is, is not there. So one of the questions we ask Christian is, is how can we understand this? Uh, and it turns out that uh, this can be explained by an isotropic exchange once again. Just to convince you that indeed this mode is broad, you see here the resolution of the instrument compared to the width of this uh, of these excitations here. I'm cutting like this. Uh, this is very sharp in low field where nothing else changes than the field and now this gets very broad. So this is an evidence for, for magnum decay. Uh, what kind of magnum decay? So here we have an isotropic exchange. So in our Hamiltonians, we have terms like S plus S plus. And so this S plus S plus terms can, for instance, lead a single magnon to emit a bound state and continue its way, or a single ion bound state to emit magnons. And so these uh, decay mechanisms are not present, you know, in other materials as far as I know, or maybe they are, but have not been seen or understood. And so if you incorporate these uh, diagrams in, um, spin with, in, in spin with theory, well, actually, I, I'm just contradicting myself here. Uh, in fact, this, these diagrams have been seen in a, in a slightly different context, which is the context of triplon excitations in this uh, uh, bismuth copper uh, phosphate material by uh, Ken Plump and uh, uh, Toronto group. And so where they see actually the decay of the triplons in the triplon continuum. And that comes from also an isotropic exchange of, of, this, of the same type. So in the triplon context, this has been seen, but in, uh, you know, in, the, in the context of this uh, uh, uniaxial system, this, this is the first time. Okay, so what does it mean? Well, it means we have, um, so we have decay channels. So if you want to understand if your spin waves can decay, you need to understand kinematic conditions. And so, um, you know, I invite you to download the paper, print it, get a good, nice cup of coffee, and, and, and look at this um, uh, 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 decay diagrams here because there are many types of continuum that you can imagine plotting, and there are many kinematic conditions that can or cannot be fulfilled. But uh, when Chong Chung calculates, he sees that decays are possible here, a branch that we do not see, and here and here, and these branches we see, and you see that indeed where kinematic conditions for decay are fulfilled, this is also where in the in the spin wave theory with one loop correction we see decay, and also where we see it in the data. So this is a clear evidence that these decay mechanisms are taking place in the system. Um, 
Okay, so uh, a, a bit more intriguing in some of these calculations. At three Tesla, we, we were expecting to see uh, also very strong magnum decay that is not really seen in the data. Um, and that's uh, an even more exotic phenomena where we have uh, one magnum that emits two magnum bond states. But because these two magnum bond states, when they are free, they can recombine into a four magnum bond state, essentially the decay product leads to a new quasi-particle, and that suppresses the decay rate of that diagram. So we also see not only the, the new types of decay, but the absence of another type of decay because we have these bond state excitations. So it's a, it's a multiverse of magnons, and you can have fun with it if you, if you want. Uh, good, so uh, that's uh, one thing. Uh, then let me, uh, I have five minutes left, which I will uh, do relativistically, uh, with relativistic corrections, this will be eight minutes. So. Uh, I'll do a finer temperature dynamics uh, for a little bit. So uh, just to uh, show something that we are working on right now is, is we have all these excitations. We have all this nonlinear dynamics. Can we explain the temperature dependence of our magnet? Uh, so uh, here, this is, an, uh, this is the data I already showed you. So in the ordered phase, we see these two bands of scattering. But when we uh, raise the temperature of the magnet, we see that these excitations evolve in a, in a dramatic way and, and, and melt. And the question is, how do you describe the melting of these excitations in a system which has off diagonal exchange and, and these exotic um, excitations? And so uh, the way to do this is to do Landau Lipschitz dynamics generalized to SU and coherent states. So this is what um, um, they're also doing in Christian's group with David Dalbums and George and Bai and uh, using this uh, software package. And so uh, essentially, uh, we, we can model these dynamics, but there is a big challenge in the simulations, which is that. You want to model the system across a huge um, range of temperatures, and when you do so, uh, you need to uh, be careful that the quantum sum rule at low temperature and the classical sum rule at, at high temperatures are different. And so this was pointed out a long time ago by uh, Alan Radu and, and Uberman in this paper. So uh, uh, they found a way to do this in, in these simulations where we essentially rescale the moments that we simulate classically as a function of temperature. Um, and we do so, we do this rescaling of the moment by making sure that at every temperature we simulate, the sum rule of the neutron scattering is enforced. And by doing so, this allows us to continuously uh, capture the, the quantum to classical crossover in the simulations and model the dynamics. And so when we do so, uh, we can model essentially the finite temperature dynamics of the system to, to very good accuracy. Um, and if we are not doing this, this would not work. I can show you some, some graphs in the um, after the talk, but, uh, but yeah, so we can understand the nonlinear dynamics, thermal dynamics of the system using this, uh, using this theory. So having an Hamiltonian that you understand of your system allows you to do a lot of things. I know I don't have much time left. I'll just show you the cobalt iodine for two minutes. Um, so uh, uh, there's two takeaways here in this system. So it's a spin one half system and it has this LX1 type structure. If you want to stabilize an LX1 type structure on the triangular lattice, you have two possibilities in some sense. So you need the J3, and the question is, do you use a J2 or do you use a, a nearest neighbor of diagonal exchange interaction? So that was the, the dilemma that the student in Korea was facing when, when understanding the system. Uh, and it turns out that the technique where we use the instantaneous correlations, the SCGA technique, for instance, does not really distinguish between these two models, so it's not very good. Uh, but uh, what the student did is actually model the dynamics in the paramagnetic regime, the full energy result dynamics in the, in the paramagnetic regime. And here, this is the data. Here, this is one model with off-diagonal exchange and one model, J1, J2, J3. And you see here that the data resembles much more the, J, the anisotropic model than the J1, J2, J3. So we are now at the level where we can extract Hamiltonians from, from the finite temperature dynamics of the system, where it might be easier to understand and model. Um, what about the ordered state? So here are the excitations in the ordered state. So here, this is the data, two directions. So direction in the triangular lattice plane, energy transfer. Uh, so this is one energy transfer of 17 millivolt and another one of eight millivolt. Uh, just for the experts, this is um, something we call rep rate multiplication. This was measured in Japan. So we have spectrometers now where we have several wavelengths that are incoming on the, on the sample at the same time. So this allows us to see the same signal with different resolutions in different coverage, if you wish, and this was very useful in the system because it shows you that these broad spin waves here are independent of the EI, so independent of the resolution of the spectrometer, and they must come from magnon decay, and so this is, to me, a very clear evidence that, that this is the case. So uh, you see in this magnet, we have well-defined spin waves at low energy, but when we pass two millivolts, excitations get really broad. Why do they get broad? 
Um, well, the simple thing you can do uh, uh, that Sasha told us to do is, is, and, and is right, is to calculate the two magnon density of state. If your spin waves overlap with your two magnon density of state, maybe you will have magnon decays. And this is clear that where our spin waves here get broad, uh, this is where they overlap with the two magnon density of state. And uh, um, so this is a very strong evidence for one of those quantum corrections in the system. Um, and so thinking a la Chernyshev Zitomirsky, which is my childhood, um, in science, uh, we see here uh, uh, two things that are characteristic of cubic interactions in, in a magnet. One of them is spontaneous magnon decay, and the other one is this branch of spin waves here, which is repelled from the continuum, and so this is coming from the real part of the self-energy correction here. Uh, and you might ask, what is the origin of the cubic vertex? So here we have a magnet that is both, both anisotropic and has non-collinearity, so the, the, the cubic term comes from both of this, I think both of these terms in the Hamiltonian. Okay, I'm done, two minutes, of, uh, what, what, 30 seconds for conclusion. So, most definitely we can have strong symmetric of diagonal exchange on the triangular lattice and we can see very strong spontaneous magnon decay. To me, this is a great surprise in some sense we've, we've been looking for this of diagonal exchange in transition metal, in, in rehearsed triangular systems, but they show up in the transition metal. So I have a prop for, but Jeff will probably tell, oh, this is completely expected. At least this was not expected to me. And finally, my crackpot slide, which is that um, um, for the very end and for entertainment for lunch, so in FEI2, I claim that we have an analogy with neutrino mixing. So we have different flavors of magnons. As you know, in the standard model, there's different flavors of neutrinos. And so, uh, as you know, in the standard model, the, the electron, mu, and tau neutrinos are not eigenstates. So this is the same here. The, the magnons are not eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. In neutrinos, they see oscillations in the time domain between neutrino flavors. And in FEA2, we see oscillations in momentum space between uh, all magnum flavors. With this, I'll thank uh, the people that have to endure me all the time at Georgia Tech, and uh, thanks for your attention. We have time for some relativistic questions. Well, I'll start. Uh, I mean, it's, it's more a comment. I mean, I don't know if it's a comment or a question, but um, I like your mammal labeling. Uh, but how do you distinguish? I mean, I would feel like at, at um, you know, long distance interactions might be competitive with, you know, also biquadratic interactions. Um, okay, so the. So the... I would. Uh, you know, than ab initio or more, uh, even more detailed uh, fitting needs to be done. But I feel like, you know, if you start having J3 or J4, this might just as be just as uh, competitive as, um, you know, biquadratic, anisotropic biquadratic nearest neighbor interactions. Um, yeah, okay. So, so first one thing about the mammal. Uh, so, so what I like about this is that, so this, determining this interact, the, the anisotropic exchange and the further neighbor exchange relies on different part of the neutron scattering cross section. The anisotropic exchange is the polarization factor. You know, we see pair Q. And so by mapping pair Q, we really have sensitivity to spin space. Whereas the Fourier transform gives us sensitivity to the different terms. So I like this, you know, what is anisotropic exchange from what is further neighbor exchange. Now the biquadratic becomes a complication because because it does not neatly neatly fit into this. Um, so 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 I think this biquadratic to all the terms is a challenge. It's it's really difficult to you know. I think I think only modeling will be able to to tell us that. Um, yeah, sure. I'm I'm just pointing out that you know in addition to nearest neighbor bilinear and isotropic further exchange, you also have. Um, by quadratic exchange, and maybe it's a complication, but it might just as well be as important, depending on the material. It's a new species of, uh, of mammal. Uh, so, Sasha? It's also just a comment. When you, when you talked about triplon uh, tri uh, work, I think the mechanism was uh, slightly different. It was due to Dilashinsky Marie and not J. Ah, so okay. I don't think J existed okay. in this field. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 anisotropic exchange, but yeah, of the, of the aniso anisotropic exchange. Okay. So let's yeah. Uh, hi. Thank you for your very nice talk. 
So I have a question about your procedure, how you determine exchanges from the high temperature data. So how sensitive those results are to the details of the background subtraction and how big should be your signal uh, to be able to do such a procedure in your experience? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So, so, so we are fortunate here that we actually, you know, a very, very strong signal that comes from this magnet. Um, and uh, so, so the, 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 the real difficulty in fitting this S of Q, so my laser is that, but the S of Q, uh, of course, will have zero energy mode. And at zero energy, there's a lot of the background coming from the sample environment and things like this. So this, in other systems, that was a huge problem we had to face. Here, the signal is so strong. And because we can measure at 11 Kelvin, we can have a very, very lean cryostat. So we essentially have almost zero background. If you do it in a, in a dilution fridge or something like this, this will be much more challenging. But, um, but what I think is emerging is, is that very well, if that's the case, then let's fit the dynamics in the power magnetic regime. And if we fit the dynamics in the power magnetic regime, then we do, we can go away from the elastic line where there's a lot of background. And I think in, in some cases, this will actually be the way to do it. Um, but so that's a great question. It depends a bit on the problem, and, and uh, but but I think it's it's an, it's a nice way to do it. And I will caution about one thing, which is if you if you're taking many different temperatures into account in your model, you have to be careful with this um, with what we call the temperature, you know, the, the the quantum to classical classical renormalization factor. So as you change temperatures vastly, your your Landau Lipschitz calculations have to be rescaled. Otherwise, you will you will get something wrong. So um, we, we can talk about this if you're, if you're interested. But if you do a single temperature, I think, I think you're probably safe. So I think your agreement between your measurement and the, and the calculation that you have is really spectacular. So my, the question I'm going to ask is kind of moot already. But um, have you considered the effect of uh, dipolar interactions? Because I have worked on uh, yeah. cesium iron chloride, and there it was really, really important. And you also have a large magnetic moment here. So. Yeah, maybe so I missed that, but uh... let me go to this phase diagram. So, okay. So above four Tesla, you see there are these different pockets that are emerging. Yeah. So these are metamagnetic transitions between different structures of the magnet. Mm -hmm. We've we've done the similar measurements you've done. So specifically, at very low temperature, changing the magnetic field. Um, you know, at 200 millikelvin, we see 35 different phases coming one after the other. And that's, we believe, is a dipole-dipole interaction that sets what in about and selects. Your spectrum? Yeah. What about your spectrum? Do the dipole-dipole interactions have any effect on your spectrum? On the spectrum, on the spectrum, I don't think so. On the spectrum, I don't think so because we have a, dip, we have a, a single ion and isotropy of the scale of, I mean, whatever, 2 millivolt, right? So, so everything is kind of like, you know, so, so if, you think okay. about the, if you think about the role of dipole-dipole, this will essentially add the JZ term that will shift things a little bit, but that will be a variation around that large single ion energy scale. Mm -hmm. But for the phases at low temperature, absolutely, this is, this is a mess. I, ne I need uh, to, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so this is a comment about your question, Lucille. I, first of all, I fully agree with you. In general, one should keep the four spin interactions in mind. In this particular compound, you can tell that they are very small because a biquadratic interaction will give dispersion to this flat mode. The quadrupolar mode, as soon as you have that biquadratic interaction, can move, right? So, and the fact that it's flat is telling you that, you know, it is not there. So, actually, we include that biquadratic interaction, and we noticed that it was very small because otherwise that quadrupolar mode will not be flat. In fact, that's the first thing you guys did, no? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, it's a in principle, I guess I was imagining this. Uh, well, from uh, regarding the bound state decay, so I remember from the triplon systems, um, we never got a case where uh, there was kind of an avoided decay. Can you have avoided decay from the bound states? I mean, can you just partially decay, keep a Z factor on them? Are there cases where you can have that? Maybe you so, so, so we do have this avoided decay, but it's... Um, but it, it is, is it on the bound states? So, so here the avoided decay is when this branch is strongly hybridizes oh, with the, the continuum and, and goes down, right? Okay. So um, the, the type of avoided decay we have is that the decay products are, in some sense, um, they, they feel a bound state that is proximate in energy, and so this prevents this decay mechanism from happening. So this is a type of, of, of avoided decay, but not to the two-particle continuum of the same type 
it's two, a, a, a two particle bond state of another type. So it's a little bit, there's many different flavors of quasi particles, but in some sense it's the same. There is an eigen state that prevents the decay from happening. Thank you. Um, yeah, beautiful one, very nice. So um, you highlighted at some point uh, the benefits of stabilizing a single magnetic domain with applied field. Yeah. Do you have a, an understanding why it's possible to do that in this yeah, case? Yeah. Is it because you have bond directional exchange? No, this is because of this competition between single ion and isotropy and exchange and isotropy. Um, in the modeling that Christian is doing with the Corian states, the quantization axis of the Corian state is 10 degrees away from orthogonal to the triangular plane. Because of bond directional? Because of bond directional, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, so, yeah. So now, the old diffraction works, they did not do a single domain, so they, they found a magnetic structure that is, you know, along Z. But we did not intend to do this. I mean, okay, we, we misaligned the sample and we got lucky. So, so you understand a posteriori. Yeah, so that's which, fine. yeah, that's fine. That's, yeah, I'm saying it openly. Yeah. <laughs> Luck is, 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 yeah. Are there any more questions? I'm way over time, sorry. No, am I over time? No, you're not. Ah, okay. But, uh, we had a lot already. To... <laughs> okay. So, um, if not, let's thank uh, Martin and all the speakers from this morning. Thank you. <laughs> And so we reconvene for the afternoon session at 2, and then there will be a poster session and some kind of buffet and then dinner. <laughs>